friends. Welcome to the Mobile Bev Pros podcast, a podcast dedicated to providing mobile bar and event professionals with the information they need to succeed. I'm your host, business coach, and founder of the Mobile Bar Academy, Sarah Murphy. In each episode, the Mobile Bev Pros team will bring you industry experts, information, anecdotes, and opinions with the goal of assisting you in building a profitable, sustainable, and successful business that supports you in creating wealth. I'm excited to share with you today's episode, so let's get started. Today on the podcast, we have a very special treat. I feel like this podcast episode is going to be one that people realize they've been waiting for since they started their business and didn't know they needed it. Today, we're talking with Chris with Veracity Insurance Solutions, which is actually the managing general agent company for Flip and through a layer of complexity that I'm not going to get into, also Canopy or Insurance Canopy, which are two of the most popular insurance programs that we recommend in our industry because they have policies that tailor closely and are fairly easy to get and also affordable for new or scaling mobile bar companies. And so if you're listening to this and you're not familiar with either Flip or Canopy, Just know that they are potentially really good options for you if you're still looking for insurance or trying to source insurance for your company. And we have lots and lots of questions and lots to cover today. So I'd love to just get started. Thank you, Chris, for being here. Well, thank you for the invitation. We appreciate it. So I used Flip when I was a mobile bar owner a number of years ago, not for the first couple of years, because I don't think I knew Flip existed. I used USLI. Mm -hmm. And out of nowhere, one day I got a letter from USLI that said that they were dropping me. There wasn't really much of an explanation. They didn't really probably have to give me much of an explanation. And that was what precipitated my looking to see like what else was out there. And I found Flip and there wasn't at the time a whole lot of reviews. Nobody had really used you in the industry. And so it was a bit of a gamble on my part to be like, yeah, let's use this way less expensive company that I can just sign up for with very few questions in about 15 minutes and then consider myself insured. But I never had any issues. Customer service was pretty good. It was very easy for me to get certificates of insurance, which historically when I did this for my job, I'd have to like email someone and then they would email them back to me within like a day. And y'all was just very quick. And so lots and lots of perks, but there's always been kind of this undercurrent of, are they going to cover if anything goes wrong? Because here's one thing I know about insurance is that on the surface that you guys, and I said, don't say you guys like in a direct, yeah, I understand. but like, oftentimes it's like, you ask a few questions and then like, yes, we'll cover you. And then it comes time to actually utilize an insurance. And then you ask even more questions and it's like, oh yeah, actually we don't cover that. It's like, well, you've been taking my premium for <laughs> three years. And so yep. like, so I think there's a level of distrust that I'd like to uh, kind of start to erase yeah, absolutely. Here so that there's more trust in the flip and canopy programs, because there's always those anecdotal stories that people will be like, Oh, I knew someone who had to use them and they got declined. And I want people to know, like, there's so many reasons that a claim could get declined. So one of the things I want to talk about today on the podcast is like some of best practices to ensure that you're operating in a way that would keep you within coverage and doesn't violate the coverage that you have within your insurance, which would lead to getting a claim declined. But so much to cover. Why don't we start there? As okay. someone who covers mobile bar companies, which are historically, I think, really kind of risky companies to cover because we serve a controlled substance, though I was joked that like restaurants are absolutely like all the worst nightmares. There's alcohol, there's sharp <laughs> objects, there's slippery floors, yes. <laughs> there's people with felonies. There's all the risk things in restaurants. We've got to be easier uh, to cover than that. But what are some best practices for m- ensuring that you operate your mobile bar in a way that stays within the guidelines of a policy? That's a very layered question. So we'll kind of hit on different layers and then we can go from there. Is that fair? So first of all, I think that it's really important that an insured is transparent with their business operations in the application process to the underwriter or the insurance agent, because that's really where a lot of this will start. And then I think it's really important that if you deviate after you got the insurance in place and deviate from your normal practice is to have that conversation. That's what a lot of people don't do because 
there's specific warranties that we can get into in a policy and certain endorsements in a policy that can restrict the coverage just to your business operation that's been declared or warranties within the policy says if you don't do these things that your policy or insurance coverage could be actually totally denied. And some of those warranties go with some state guidelines. So if you violate state guidelines, then that endorsement then follows that state guideline. And then like, for example, you can only serve to a certain hour, right? And in the policy, if the warranty says you can't serve past 2 a.m. and you do, and there's a claim that arises, that policy is probably not going to respond to that claim. So there's really, when you're talking about best practices in my mind is first being transparent and don't be overly aggressive with your sales. We see that all the time, especially with the new business, they're excited and they're getting business loans and they inflate their projections. Don't do that with your insurance because we want realistic expectation set so we can get a premium developed that's going to be right for you if you do more policies are auditable and they can you know come back and get more premium but don't want to get too far down that rabbit hole when people think of sales in the mobile bar space we obviously Mm -hmm. are thinking about the total revenue that we brought in or that we anticipate bringing in and once upon a time i heard and it's something that people pass along in the industry is that the only sales that are relevant for liquor liability are the sale of alcohol. And the vast majority of mobile bars that operate in the United States do so as what we love to call dry hire, which means we're just Mm -hmm. providing mixers, non-alcoholic beverages, services, equipment rental, and then the client is providing the alcohol. So if we were to look at it through that lens, we actually make no money through the sale of alcohol in relation to liquor liability. So which of the two Are you really asking on that form when you ask about sales? Are you asking us about our total net sales or are you asking about sales from the sale of alcohol? And it's going to differ by insurance company. But on our application, we have a total gross sales and then we have an alcohol sales. And so that helps us determine exposure. And obviously, depending on the sales, the premium is going to be higher or lower. But there are some companies that will like you you had mentioned previously that you know sometimes you get lumped into a restaurant class code and in those cases there's certain insurance carriers that say we cannot have our alcohol sales be above 50 percent or more of the total gross sales and so there's some things in the underwriting guidelines that will then based on those questions make you eligible or ineligible in the flip scenario they ask for both and i think in flip if you get over a certain amount of sales, you just become ineligible for the entire program. But then we have additional resources for you to get insurance elsewhere if you're too big for the actual flip program. So I hope that's answered your question. Yes, it does. Okay, perfect. I think it's important to understand a couple of things. If I can give just a little bit of insurance background, that might be helpful. There's an organization called Insurance Services Office, or ISO, we call it for short. Okay, And ISO standardizes a lot of the insurance policies that insurance companies use. Now, not all insurance use the companies use ISO or ISO formatting, but ISO has what they call a state grade. And that's based on the litigious environment or the legal environment of those states because of the dram shop laws. And they'll grade it from zero being the best to 10 being the worst. Okay. So just depending on the state you're in can derive or push you to certain insurance carriers because their appetites might change. But, you know, talking about an insurance carrier, yesterday I was talking to an underwriter and I said, what you won't insure somebody in South Carolina, it's only a state grade six, which is really favorable. Their comment was, yeah, but we've had a lot of losses there. And so even though ISO, the insurance service office, says it's a good state, the insurance companies had a bad experience there. Therefore, they decide not to write in that state. So if you're having a difficult time getting coverage because of the state, you just need to find, in my opinion, an independent broker or us that can help and go and shop and find these different insurance carriers that have an appetite to write in that state. And then secondly, which we talked about is the transparency and not over inflating your numbers. And if you have a change in your business operation, make sure it's known so that 
if there needs to be a modification of the insurance policy, that can happen. Give you a quick example. Again, this underwriter yesterday, let's say that we had a mobile bartender in Georgia, but then gets a job in South Carolina. As soon as they go up into South Carolina, if they were with this particular insurance company, now they have zero coverage because it's an ineligible state. So just, you know, you think about New Jersey, New York, and some of these states that have close proximity is just make sure that you convey that you may be traveling to these other states because that could have an impact on the coverage itself. So as far as best practices from an insurance person standpoint, it would be just, we need to understand all the exposures so that we can try and put the best policy in place for your business. Understanding that everybody has limitations, conditions, exclusions, and we can talk about those also that you need to be aware of what those are. That's really helpful. And if anybody's listening and you're inside the Mobile Bar Academy, we specifically recommend that you go through a local broker first before you go to Flip or Canopy. Sorry, love you guys. But that's our <laughs> default that's, suggestion okay. because of the complexity of our industry. Not not only do we not really fit in the restaurant box right. or the catering box, Correct. but we do serve alcohol, but we don't sell alcohol, which again, right. are, you know, sometimes confuses people. We also have oftentimes equipment like mm -hmm. vintage horse trailers right. or vintage campers that have been made into, you know, bars that we're serving right. out of. And they're driving down the road. They've been potentially modified in our backyards, but they're moving down the road at hurricane speeds yep. by someone who potentially DIYing it and has never yep. built a thing in the world, right? Yep. And so we just have really unique needs. And it's so much easier, in my opinion, to try and get proper coverage when you can sit in front of a human and make them understand the needs of your business and right. what you're trying to accomplish instead of filling out an online form and then hoping that you checked all right. the boxes. The, the other thing I, I get back is like, I've talked to local insurance brokers. They have no idea how to cover right. me. What do you tell the people who are talking to insurance brokers that honestly, and I feel like this way with business brokers too, they look at a business and if it doesn't fit all their little yep. boxes, they're like, sorry, we can't take this for you. They don't necessarily want to go and like learn anything about the industry right. or, you know, talk to somebody They like get best practice. So like yep. where does someone who's done the thing, they've reached out to different brokers and the brokers are kind of like, I don't know how to help you. Like, where do they go from there? Right here, baby. Because we see that a lot. Certain brokers or agents will focus in areas that they feel comfortable in, but then they get an outlier and they're like, I'll see what I can do. And they try and piece something together. The insurance canopy side of our business is a national retail agency that understands the in the marine, which cover, as you said, these vintage things that are going down the road and the commercial auto and the liquor liability that may need some more handholding than what Flip can offer, right? And so there's resources there. I mean, if somebody's not serving your purpose or you don't feel comfortable, you got to make another call. I mean, that's really all there is to it until you find somebody that actually sounds intelligent about the business and that you can feel comfortable with and they'll go through the policy with you. Outside of that, it's just like any other profession, whether it's a doctor or carpenter or whatever it is, you got to find somebody you're comfortable with that can give you the information you need to make good business decisions. So I don't want to forget to talk about some of the common exclusions um, yep. in the fine print because... Oftentimes we will get people that'll say, oh, that's illegal for me to do. It's not illegal. It's probably something your insurance company said you shouldn't do, which we probably would support if your insurance company says right. don't do it. But some of those things are, you had mentioned, you know, no service after a certain hour. Right. It, you mentioned 2 a.m., which is very common. Sometimes it's midnight in right. some states. Mm -hmm. Commonly you hear no shots, no doubles, no needs. Right. That's just good risk mitigation. Again, we really try and make sure that we're setting people up in this industry to understand what it means to mitigate risk in business right. operations. Y'all kind of hold hands with the attorneys when it comes yeah. to mitigating risk. And so certainly you'll probably have some of those things. I did have someone last week say, actually, it's in my insurance policy that I can't serve shots. I'd never heard that before. But what are some common ones? Again, recognizing different states. Different yeah, that's a big question. Because 
because there's so many variables when it comes to the liquor liability policy and different insurance companies are going to be looking at different warranties and exclusions and things. You know, you named any type of games. Most insurance companies don't want games. If you were selling beer or liquor, they don't want you to be like selling beer for less than 250 or something like that. So that, you know, if somebody's not like, give me 20 of these things. But some of the warranties within a policy, I think everybody should review their policies and be able to go, oh, what does, even what does this mean? Or what does this mean to me? If I were to just say, boil it down, the warranty is really critical because you are warranting me, the insurance company, that you will do specific things. And if you don't, they can deny coverage. Okay. So you have exclusions in a policy just that we're just not going to cover this stuff. And a lot of the typical exclusions are things that would be covered under another, like the general liability policy. So slip and falls, product liability. So liquor liability is basically covering injuries that are caused by the selling and distributing of an alcoholic beverage. Okay. That's where it's been down to. Allegedly. Alleged. Exactly. <laughs> Allegedly. But then you get into the warranties, which can be, you know, I've seen like nobody but a employee can serve the alcohol. If any employee is consuming alcohol while they're doing their service, that could cause an exclusion in the policy. If you don't have an enforced general liability policy in conjunction with your liquor liability, that can be a warranty that excludes coverage. If you lied on your application that you had ordinance related and safety related fines and penalties, or if you've had citations, or if you declared bankruptcy and you didn't notify them, some of those can be listed in warranties. So warranties aren't usually long. They're usually one page. You can find them in the policy. They usually have some kind of title that says warranty or something in there. But I would say that's a really good place to start and then go visit the other exclusions in the policy. And if you're really concerned, you know, get with your insurance professional and go, look, I need to walk through this. Let's take a half hour and walk through this and let's make sure that, you know, we're comfortable with the coverage. I do have to say when you brought up risk, because there's risk management tools. And one of the things within risk that sometimes business owners forget is that you just assume it. No matter what you do, there's just risk with business. And my goal when I'm dealing with a client is to be able to provide them the information necessary so that they can now make a decision of, okay, I'm going to move forward with this, or I don't want that, but there's a certain assumption of risk that you have as a business owner that you're just going to take it on the chin if something happens. The critical part is knowing what that is, because a lot of business owners find out, like you said, they get a policy, all of a sudden they have a claim come up and now they're just scratching their head. Why aren't I covered? Or how come I didn't do this? It's all good to have that beforehand. And business owners typically are not pessimistic about their own business. You got to kind of put on a hat sometimes of going, what can go wrong? What am I afraid of? What's going to keep me up at night? Let's have a discussion. And what can I push to somebody else through insurance policy or whatever? And what do I have to assume? I love all of that. That's why we call it risk mitigation yeah. because like the risk is there. All we can do is mitigate it, right? Yeah, in the best. Exactly. And I love that you mentioned just reading the warranty page because a lot of times when we hear this anecdotal stories of I had a claim with so-and-so, they denied it, et cetera, et cetera. What you're actually missing from that story is that there was something in the warranty section that didn't have anything to do with the claim itself. The insurance company wouldn't have known until there was a claim. And then the insurance company's yep. putting their little investigator hat on and they're yep. going through the checklist to ensure that everything is the yep. way it was supposed to be. And so there was no way for the insurance company to know that you had right. violated this warranty until you decided to file yep. the claim. And now you're just under scrutiny. And so I love that you added that. And if I can add that, to, because we see this in a lot of different industries, especially mobile kind of businesses, they get busy and they'll go, hey, friend, can you come give me a hand, right? I need somebody to come and help me. And right there can violate a warranty just by somebody helping you. And so they don't think of that kind of a thing. And so if you've got volunteer workers or friends or people that are coming in, you got to make sure that anybody you're bringing to help you is going to be covered under the insurance policy or you could create a problem. You mentioned earlier that you specifically use the word employee. And that reminded mm -hmm. me 
one of the other things that kind of comes up is that mobile bars are historically known to hire a lot of 1099 contractors mm-hmm. for a variety of reasons, seasonality, maybe established business wherein I don't need anybody for more than just a couple events a year, right. whatever they, that might look more just oftentimes because they've never had an employee and they've never gone through the process of figuring out how to have one. And two, it's more expensive because now we have right. weird on additional fees from taxes and the right. you know payroll processing yeah. and all that. Is it policy by policy as to whether or not 1099s are covered or did they have to be employees or is it state specific? You know, I'm not going to say every insurance policy because I don't know, but everyone that I know about usually says they have to be an employee of the company. Now, most insurance companies look at a 1099 as a whole separate business. So let's talk about this risk transfer. Okay. In a perfect world, Let's say that I hired you, Sarah, as a 1099. I would say, Sarah, here's a contract. I need you to provide your insurance via certificate of insurance to me, name me as additional insured, and all those things that you're asked for by a venue. You would do that, and that's a risk transfer to that 1099. So insurance companies look at the 1099 as people that just aren't part of the insured's business. Therefore, they should be standing on their own. Now, our insurance policy expands the definition of employee to include volunteer workers, meaning they're not paid at all, temporary workers, and leased workers. Not all policies do that. It's really important that you, again, look at the definition of what an employee is, because that can vary, and be able to have that discussion and see if that fits within the model. And then make the decision again, that if you're going to hire a 1099, but know that they don't have insurance and you don't have insurance for them, that's an assumption of risk that you're going to be taking. Okay, so when you said temporary worker, yes, does that include a 1099? And is there a payment threshold there? No, the temporary worker is actually defined by the insurance policy. So it says a temporary worker is a person who is furnished to you, the insured, to substitute for a permanent employee on leave or to meet a short-term workload. So it's typically, if you had an employee and they're gone, the temporary employees filling their place. Thank you for that clarification, because I do feel like sometimes when we hear certain words, we interpret them in a certain way. We were assuming temporary means that they're only working with us for a few shifts, right? And I've had this done with liquor laws too, where people are like, oh, I can sell things like boozy pops because I read the code and the code said that as long as it's under 5% alcohol, that we can sell these to go. And then I read it and I say, yes, that is true. If you had an on-premise liquor license, but you don't <laughs> like yeah. you have that, you miss that yeah. part because these codes are long and you know, yeah. they're kind of annoying to, to read, but context is really important. Can I expand on that? Because I like the context because now what happens is because you've taken the liquor product that was produced by a third party, whatever liquor manufacturer, and you have created your own product from it, popsicle or whatever it is, that is now your product and it, it becomes a product liability issue and your liquor liability may not cover your products. And so it's really important, again, if you're going to be making product from alcohol, you've got to check with your insurance provider because that changes. That's kind of those business operations I'm saying that can change to where your insurance policy is going, I'm out. I exclude product liability. Uh, I'm going to geek out a little bit. So let's say I'm at an event and I am creating a product because I'm creating a cocktail and I'm handing it to a person. Right. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. But the minute I put it in a can... Even if I'm still at the event, maybe I just can a bunch of them because it's yeah. cool and I yeah. hand those out. And I put my business name on it or whatever. Right. Yep. That's your product now. Oh, and so that's not covered. It, it may not product, be covered. It would be okay. It was, if we can it and give it out, it changes. Yeah, so it. anything, you look at what a product is, it's any product that is manufactured, sold, or distributed by the insured. And that can be just taking something and relabeling it can now to make it your product. You know, like you said, can it, put a label on it. So mixing the drink, that's just like, I'm going to say food prep, right? I get a hot dog, I put it in the bun, I put must. That is a food product that's all part of the thing. But now if I go, hey, I got a better widget for ketchup, so I'm going to make my own ketchup, that is now their product. And it's the same thing in every business. As soon as you start manufacturing something, 
whether it's just taking two parts that are already manufactured and you put it in your own container and you relabel it, it is yours now. Devils in the details. Such a <laughs> such a nuanced experience that we that we have. Okay, so every once in a while, I will get someone that drops into my inbox, and it's always an SOS. Mm. I've been in business for six, eight, ten years, and no problems, no claims. I've just been dropped. Every quote that I've gotten at this point is double or triple what I was paying before. You kind of alluded earlier, I think after we started recording that oftentimes like things in the state just change. Mm -hmm. Like how do we mitigate? That's a hard one for an actual insurer to do anything about, because I think we were talking a little bit about before state legislation that somebody with a stroke of a pen can change that, that changes the legal environment for that state and makes it more difficult for insurance companies to operate there. Because a lot of dram shop laws become very pro injured party and therefore hold the server highly responsible for anything that's going to happen. So the more responsibility that the state laws and regulations put on that server, the higher the chance the insurance company is going to have to pay out on claims. Like I said before, that underwriter from that specific company, although South Carolina is a great state per ISO, right? Saying, hey, this is a good state to work in. They've had a terrible loss experience. So they're like, we got to get out of here. And so people are subject to the legislative side of things, you know, what laws are being passed and how that's going to be affecting the actual legal environment. Then it comes to claims experience that the insurance company has. And especially if those two collide in a negative way, the insurance company is saying our exposure to pay out a million dollar claim just went up significantly because of X happened. Therefore, we feel that we need to charge more to offset our claims experience that's going to be coming down the road. And that's what happens. And sometimes there's just not a whole lot you can do, but just shop around like crazy and see if you can find somebody that can do it cheaper. I mean, in a total different industry, we had a court and just kind of, this is how stuff happens is, you know, in one specific state, a judge, although this specific thing was excluded by the insurance policy, the judge says, we don't care, you're going to pay. And the insurance company had to pay out $2 million. Now everybody's going, what's Missouri doing? Now we have a precedence that this judge is set going, doesn't matter what's excluded in the policy. So everybody's running scared. These kind of situations that it's like, you can't mitigate it. You've just got to figure out what you're going to do now because it's totally out of everybody's control. Yeah. And I like that you mentioned that because the reason I'm saying you need to make sure you have liquor liability coverage is because it may be easy for people to say, well, it's too expensive. I can't run my business no. without it because something happened. They doubled or tripled my rates. And so I'm just going to go without it. We have another client in Hawaii who's like, I can't seem to get coverage. And so like, we're just doing the best we can without it. And unfortunately, like that is a very dangerous place to be, even though it's doubling and tripling and and there's a whole lot of unknowns as to what causes the increased rates or whether the rates will increase three days from now. Yeah. You have to be covered. And so, yeah, shop around, get second opinions, make sure that you are reading your fine print, that yeah. you are doing your best to mitigate your risk, not taking events that would increase your risk. But ultimately, Correct. if you're in business long enough in this industry, it's not a matter of if you will have a claim, it's when you will have right. a claim, not even right. if it wasn't you who did the thing that precipitated the need to do so. I have a lot of people ask me, which is an interesting question in my mind where they'll say, well, can I get sued? It's like, well, yes. You know, there's no limit on how many people can be named in a lawsuit. And like you had mentioned, the actual legal costs, even if you're not liable for any damages, if you're brought into a suit, you're fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 to get out of it. And if you don't have insurance, you've got to take that and it's going to, you know, your personal assets, you're going to have to dig into savings or mortgage a house or whatever it is to pay for these things. And like, it's just not really worth it. I know it can be a struggle, but it, there's payment options out there. You can spread it over a period of time. There's ways that you could possibly make it work if you can, you know, and I highly recommend you should do that. 
and likely you'll have to increase your prices, which is something yeah. that we help people do with mobile yeah. web sell more confidently, whatever your rates are. So if you're not Good a member point. of the Academy already, get in there. Is there anything that you would like to make sure that our listeners hear before we hop off? I just want to stress the things that we've already talked about. Be transparent about your business. Don't add operations without notifying your insurance carrier. We're not here to run your business or tell you how to run your business, but we're here to counsel you on what would and wouldn't be covered. And you as a business owner then can make an informed decision on how to move forward. Review your policy. They're not all the same. And if you are reviewing it and have questions, just set an appointment with the insurance guy. And if they're not willing to sit with you, move on to another one. So as a business owner, in my mind, you got to inform yourself so that you have the understanding of what exposures you can pass to somebody else and what exposures you're going to take on and feel okay about it. The unknown to me is worse than knowing and being able to take some kind of action against it or prevent or reduce that risk that you may have as a business owner. This has been so informational and Amazing. We are going to have all of the contact information in the show notes, specifically for people who are potentially concerned that their current policy doesn't cover what they need. You guys can probably take a look at it and fill in any holes, any exposure that they may have based on, you know, maybe not giving the proper information or maybe just utilizing an online form that doesn't capture all of the yeah. necessary information. And so we'll have all of that in the show notes in case anybody wants to reach out. Thank you so much for your time and for providing the context and the depth around a very nuanced topic. I think it'll be very helpful for all who listen. Well, thank you. We really appreciate the opportunity. And that wraps up today's episode. I hope it was valuable. I would love to hear from you what you thought. You can drop me a line at hello at mobilebevpros.com or find me on Instagram at mobilebevpros. If you're looking for more valuable mobile bar related content, we have a website full of it. You can find us at www.mobilebevpros.com. And I'd love to see you in our Facebook community, also by the name of, you guessed it, Mobile Bev Pros. Thank you for joining me today. And until next time, cheers.